Welcome to day two of the ITF Summit Research Day. Organized together with our key research partners, ECTRI, TRB, the WCTRS, and the European Commission. And our objective today and yesterday is to bring additional research perspectives to our summit, complementing ITF's own policy work and reaching out to researchers through our partners. The summit addresses transport innovation for sustainable development and the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on policy for sustainable mobility, on climate change, on air pollution, on road safety, and on social equity. We're therefore very fortunate indeed to have with us Matthew Baldwin to start off the day with our keynote speech. In the European Commission, Matthew is DG Move's Deputy Director General and responsible for sustainable mobility policy. He has long been the Commissioner's lead in road safety policy and now also has particular responsibilities for sustainable cities. He's made a big impact in European road safety policy um, and the broader uh, responsibilities for sustainable mobility um, is going to make him a critical player uh, in Europe's um, transport policies. Now, the COVID crisis is going to leave transport operators with severe deficits that are going to need careful management by government if we're to stay the course of decarbonizing transport and making our cities more sustainable and better places to live. At the same time, the crisis has created unexpected opportunities to reallocate space, for example, for walking, cycling and micromobility. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing Matthew's views on how we can preserve that and what needs to happen now as COVID is brought under control to make mobility sustainable. So over to you, Matthew. Um, sorry, Stephen, we, we just haven't got Matthew in yet. Uh, but Matthew is connecting. Yes, hello again. Uh, we do have some technical problems uh, getting the connection with Matthew. So uh, if you could hold on, and as soon as we have him, um, I might have to say some of the introduction again, but then we'll, uh, we'll have him online as soon as we can. Can, testing, testing, can you hear me now? I hope you can hear me now. Matthew, yes, yes we can hear we you can now. Yes, we can hear you. I'm very sorry. I've had amazing troubles coming into you. I do apologize for keeping you waiting. It's great to be with you. Okay, well, I gave a, a nice introduction. I did hear you, Stephen. <laughs> oh, you did. Perfect. So you can go. Great. It was such a nice introduction. I thought I died for a minute. Uh, <laughs> and okay, it was well, a eulogy. Better. It, it turns the uh, the Zoom platform into reality. Uh, we're definitely live. <laughs> we're definitely talking to each other. So over to you well, now. Zoomed in with you. Yours. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be with you. And I'm I'm really sorry. I was also jumping in from another thing, so I was coming a bit late. So uh, and that combined with the technical problems caused the. Uh, um, some difficulties. I'm, I'm delighted to be kicking off your afternoon proceedings and a rich panel of um, a, a rich group of panels uh, all together. Too many people from DG Move popping up in those already. But uh, um, it gives me the chance perhaps to try to set it in the context of how we're addressing these very important issues um, uh, from the perspective of the European Union. And it begins, of course, and it ends with the European Green Deal where we stand proudly behind our targets to become climate neutral as a continent by 2050, which means a 90% reduction in transport emissions. And of course, we need strong interim targets, which is now we're battling away to produce the package, the Fit for 55 package to enable at least 55% of our emissions to be reduced by 2030. Why are we focusing on transport? Because transport represents a quarter of all climate emissions and it's the only sector which is now growing we have to move rapidly to address this issue in transport we're playing a major part in that we've come with a new sustainable and smart mobility strategy uh, in november in december of last year excuse me which sets out if you like our roadmap for the next decade on transport and mobility generally with a strong focus on the european green deal 
In essence, we talk about three fundamental objectives. Firstly, the need for all modes to be sustainable. As you may know, in the past, we pushed hard to try to get modal shift, for example, to get our freight off the roads and onto rail and, and, and uh, in our waterways. We're now saying that's not sufficient. All modes have got to deliver. But the second objective recognizes that some modes are going to take longer than others. Uh, for example, the aviation and, uh, and, and shipping industries are going to take a while to develop the right fuels to become sustainable. So the second objective is we've got to offer alternatives for both passengers and freight in order to meet those overall um, uh, sustainable mobility uh, targets. And thirdly, we have to incentivize those targets. It's not enough just to, sorry, those alternatives. It's not enough just to push out alternatives and hope they'll be taken up as if by magic by the mobility world. And that's the real thrust of this really quite revolutionary policy. It's pushing extremely hard. It's gonna be an enormous work. And the key to it is to ride the twin transitions, both the digital and the green transitions in that respect. The key element is a program approach. And one of the key things that we'll be doing during the course of this year is revising our plans for urban mobility. Again, we're increasingly an urban population. 70% of us live in cities. We expect that to rise to 80% by 2050. So what we do in terms of our mobility in cities is going to have a disproportionate effect on our ability to produce sustainable urban mobility, to produce safe urban mobility, and so on. Um, it's going to be a very, very important vector. Um, and so uh, we are coming forward to revisions to our urban mobility package. It's going to be called the Urban Mobility Initiative. It'll come out uh, probably in the last quarter of this year. And for the first time, we're looking at it, perhaps including legislative elements, because we're increasingly seeing that these can bring a, a strong element to the picture. One of the ideas, for example, is to make sustainable urban mobility plans, We have, which we already have more than 1,000 across Europe, indeed, across the world, with people in cities setting out how they're planning to make their ability, their mobility sustainable, to making those mandatory, particularly for the 400 or so cities of more than 100,000 population, which are on our comprehensive 10T network. So there are lots of ways we can start then to gather information, better information about cities and what they're doing in their urban mobility efforts. It's gonna be an important package and we look forward to it. The last thing I just wanted to mention about what we're, how we're tackling these issues in Europe actually brings me back to research and innovation, which is going to be uh, such an important theme uh, for your overall uh, conference this year at, at the ID, ITF. And that's our plan to have 100 cities across the European Union to become climate neutral by 2030. Again, back to the big themes of the European Green Deal. We want all cities, all parts of the European Union or regions to be climate neutral by 2050. But we think that cities are extremely well placed to lead those efforts. And so we're going to be, we set up a mission, which I'm very proud to be the manager of, to work with cities, not just on their mobility, but on their energy efficiency, on their energy production and distribution, to find ways of providing an innovation lab for all cities to follow. So I hope by the, before the end of this year, we'll be launching a call for expression of interest for cities to come and step forward and say, we are ready to be climate neutral. We want cities of all sizes from all parts of Europe for all levels of, of climate neutrality preparedness. It can't just be the same old, um, the usual suspects uh, from the north and west of Europe. We want cities from the south and east of Europe to join us in these efforts. So that's a very rapid tour d'horizon of what we're doing. Um, in the European Union. You'll hear much more, I'm sure, from our moderators uh, uh, who will be leading some of the discussions this afternoon. I'm sorry to have had such difficulties in joining you. I've tried to make that by being reasonably crisp in what I presented in terms of the big picture of what the EU is doing. But if I could finish with one thing, and that's the COVID situation. I think many people speculated when COVID hit us that in the EU, we'd have to step back from some of these ambitions. That we'd have to say, okay, it's, it's too ambitious right now to ask the economy, to our society, to make these great changes. Which is why I was intensely proud when President Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union speech uh, back in September, reiterated that we would not step back from tackling the European Green Deal. And the reasons she events were as follows. Some people want to go further and faster 
uh, and pushing the European society to, to make these changes. Some people want to go slower, but the fact is we've tested and we've measured and we know we can deliver, particularly these 55% targets by 2030. This is not a, 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 a moonshot, a, a, a pie in the sky attempt to deliver climate neutrality. We know we can do it and we know we need those strong intermediate steps. So watch this space for a, a big package of measures coming out in July to deliver the fit for 55 measures that we need, that 55% reduction by 2030. And mobility is going to play its full part in those efforts. Thank you, Stephen. Back to you and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Matthew. And um, it's extremely encouraging to hear that the uh, balance is now shifting away from modal shift, from getting all modes um, moving forward rapidly. Um, the sustainable urban mobility program um, plans, um, making that mandatory, I think is a very strong move. They've proved extremely effective. I hope you'll also be assisting cities to actually make sure all parts of those plans are implementable and some of them don't get uh, benignly or unbenignly neglected, which is um, happens to some extent. I mean, it's been very uh, successful policy starting in France and covering uh, across Europe, but uh, I'm sure there's some things that still need to be ironed out in them. Uh, and then the goal of 100 cities climate neutral by 2030 is extremely ambitious and it's going to be uh, exciting to watch how that uh, develops and how you manage it. Um, I think um, <laughs> what you said uh, also, uh, well, what you didn't say was also about the linkages to the other UN sustainable development goals uh, where road safety is critical, uh, air pollution, but the good news these is that these all uh, interact very synergistically. And I think we'll see gains on all fronts um, by pushing the climate agenda. So it will, we'll be able to deliver on all fronts uh, simultaneously. Um, you have one minute. Thank you, you want to come back road on safety, that. Stephen, you're quite right. <laughs> yeah, and of course you'll be speaking on road safety uh, next week in the session that we have in the summit then. So that's excellent. If you, if you want to say a couple of things, you need to click on your video and mute, un unmute yourself again, I think, Matthew. I, I hope that worked. Can you see my video again now? Yeah, I, I, you're quite right, Stephen. I, I neglected to make those linkages. And perhaps the best way to make those linkages, and I know we've discussed this in past in relation to road safety, it's not a perfect linkage, is in the whole area of external costs, where in the EU we've examined um, what that extent is. One of the holy grails, if you like, of our, uh, of our mobility policy in the past has been to try to identify what is the extent of the external costs. And we've come up with a number uh, of somewhere between 800 billion and 1 trillion euros a year annually in the European Union, about of which only about one third is actually internalized by taxes and charges. And what's fascinating, again, from an urban context, if you look at those different areas of external cost, it is the cost of deaths and injuries from road crashes. It is the cost of congestion, the cost of uh, uh, climate gases and air pollution and noise and habitat degradation. And if you put those things together, you realize just how big a, a challenge we face, but also if we're ready to do things like reduce our dependence on the privately owned, conventionally fueled car in cities, we can make real strides to addressing them. I know on road safety, it's an imperfect measure because it implies that there's some sort of correct number of deaths and injuries that we're going to aim at. And the only correct number of deaths and injuries is zero. But in terms of trying to actually put a true economic cost on deaths and serious injuries, as well as the terrible emotional blight that it, it poses on families, is, I think, a valuable step forward. And uh, this has been a key tool for us in identifying the needs to establish a policies which uh, uh, tackle a number of different objectives, um, uh, 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 which is really what the external cost exercise is all about. Thanks again for having this chance to add those few words. Thank you very much indeed, Matthew. And um, timing's perfect. We're now uh, one minute from the uh, parallel sessions. So I'd like to thank you again, Matthew. That was an extremely uh, useful uh, starting point for us over the next day. And um, I'll tell you how to join the parallel sessions. But first, I'd like to thank our moderators. We certainly don't have too many people from the European Commission. Um, it's uh, you can never have too many. Students.
Torsten Klimke and Robert Nissen with us to moderate the next two parallel sessions. Uh, so thank you to both of you. And um, to join the sessions, uh, you need to make the two clicks. You need to go back up into the top left and click on the timeline, not your browser's back arrow, but the timeline just below it. And when you click on that, you'll go back to the, pro the, uh, the, the program and be able to click on the parallel section session that you would like to join. So see you in a couple of minutes in uh, one of the parallel sessions. And thank you so much again, Matthew.